different reasons why the Lord is great. And that maybe you can have in your heart and mind as you think about the Lord, you would have why you think God is great, right? Um, this character is revealed in Psalm 145. And I just want to read a portion of this psalm just to prepare us as we worship the Lord and sing in Great is the Lord. Listen to God's word. I will praise you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and, every, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another 
and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And finally, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him. Let's worship the Lord. Our hearts will cry these 
take a little time here to introduce a good friend of mine that uh, I've known since the early 90s when I was a, uh, a missionary with Open Air Campaigners. Um, I used to go to First Baptist Church in uh, Weymouth, Massachusetts, and uh, Danny Croach was a missionary with uh, Good News Jail and Prison Ministry back in those days, and uh, him and I were both missionaries and uh, got to know each other, and I went to the jail down there in Plymouth Correctional center um, a number of times and was able to teach Bible lessons to the uh, inmates and um, watch Danny um, take that ministry and has thrived and he's been with uh, good nails, good news, and then he changed the ministry to New Hope Correctional and um, God's blessed him and he's got an unbelievable heart for those who are uh, trapped behind bars, who have made some stupid choices in their life and now they're they're incarcerated and, and in jail, and they're going to be there for some time, and, and they're kind of trapped, right? So it's a wonderful opportunity that, uh, to minister to them the Word of God and bring God's truth to them. Um, give them new hope, right? Mm -hmm. And offer them uh, a way out of the lifestyle that they've chosen. Um, and so Danny's got a wonderful ministry. So he's my December 30th guy. I try to get him to come on uh, December 30th. Hopefully, he puts it on his calendar for each, each time at the end of the year uh, for God to use him to be a blessing to us. So, Brother Dan, come on up and preach God's word to us, and uh, let's give him our attention. May the Lord bless you, buddy. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you again. Uh, I'm always reminded when I come here, December 30th of the uh, prayer time you guys have. God bless you. That's a really, really important thing. That's so key in any ministry and in the kingdom of God is prayer. It's, um, I, I truly believe when the awards are passed out above that those people who were in the prayer closet will be blessed abundantly because God is really the one who does everything. We're told to ask ask and we shall receive. And he does say um, in Matthew 21, 22, and, and anything you ask, believing, you shall receive. And that's, that's the key. When you go to prayer um, soon, believe. Believe that uh, this God, how great he is and awesome he is, can do the things that we can't. And he does use the Holy Spirit i got to share this little poem that I thought was really cute. I heard this from, anybody listen to Adrian Rogers? He, he, he's on uh, in the morning on, on the way to work, and he shared this poem. I loved it so much, I, I had to uh, find it and copy it. It was entitled, Sitting by the Fire. It goes like this. He wasn't much for stirring about. It wasn't his desire. No matter what the others did, he was sitting by the fire. Same old story, day by day, he never seemed to tire. While others worked to build a church, he was sitting by the fire. At last he died, as all must do. Some say he went up higher. But if he's doing what he used to do, he's sitting by the fire. 
<laughs> Little things that excite me. I, I just like that poem for some reason, and uh, it just shows us. We're only here for a little while, correct? We're just a vapor here today, gone tomorrow. And for because of what Jesus did, there's this place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. God himself wipes away every tear from every eye. I believe that. I believe that as me and you are standing, sitting here, right here, right now, I believe there is this place where there is no more sin. I mean, it's hard to imagine because, you know, we see sin all over the place. We grew up in sin. You know, it's everywhere. Turn on the TV, open a newspaper, look in the mirror. I mean, sin is everywhere. But I truly believe with all my heart there is this place where there is no sin. Try to imagine it. Try to think of it. It's almost kind of mind-blowing, mind-boggling. But there'll be no more bad thoughts, no more bad words, no more bad deeds. And, and I really, really, truly believe this. And to be honest, I can't wait to go. I mean, if God called today, I'm t let's go. If God called right now, the college I went to was named Edmund Chapel because there was a reverend named Edmund preaching at the school when all of a sudden he died, dropped dead right there at the pulpit and went to be with the Lord. And I'll tell you, man, <laughs> if there's ever a time to, a place to go, that would be awesome. Of course, going in your sleep would be nice. But where we're going, because of what Jesus did, that is worth, you know, shouting on the rooftops and telling the rest of the world. How does he do it? Well, you know, he sent his son, of course, for God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believing in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then Jesus said that when he leaves and will ascend back to the Father, he will not leave us alone, he will not leave us as orphans, he will send another, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. That's what I wanted to talk to you about today. I want to look at the Holy Spirit and we're not going to certainly get exhaustive in the Holy Spirit here and tell everything we can about you in 30, 40 minutes. There's just no way possible. But I'm just going to pull up a couple things, who he is and what he does. And I'm just going to look at some of the things because there's no way you can get it all in. But I'm going to give you some things to chew on, to think about, meditate, because it's extremely important. And when you really think about it, it kind of blows your mind. So let's uh, look in the first part of this. We're going to go into the spiritual realm, all right? I'm going to welcome you into the spiritual realm because I was, as I was looking at this Holy Spirit, I said, let's start with spirit, all right? There's a lot of things in the spiritual realm. Can I get an amen? amen. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, a lot of stuff that you don't see that's happening. I mean a lot. It's in the Bible. It's recorded for us. We're certainly not going to look at everything because we're... we're no way we can, but there are different types of spirits. Let's start there. There are different types of spirits. Do you know that there are unclean, demonic, or evil spirits? Do you understand that? They are fallen angels. They became what the Bible refers to as demons, or unclean spirits, or evil spirits. They're all one and the same, and they are fallen angels. This thing about angels is, is when, you know, there's one angel sinned up above, you know, Lucifer, the most beautiful angel of all, leading the choir. When he sinned and decided he wanted to be like God, and then thought about it for a moment and said, no, no, wait, I don't, I don't want to be like God. I want to be better than God. When he did that, sin entered into his heart. God, as it were, said, okay, Bing, you're out of here. And with him, he took, the Bible says, a third of the heavenly host. Now, the thing about angels, fallen angels, the demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits, they cannot repent. Everybody got this? They cannot repent. We, too, have sinned. We, too, have fallen from grace. But we can repent. We can turn from our sin and turn to God and be saved from the wrath of God. Satan, hell, 
self, sin. God can save us from these things. We can repent. The demons cannot. Their doom is sure. In fact, one scripture says there are a few that are chained. But the rest are all around. They can indwell people. The scriptures say they can indwell animals. And they're all around us. And as I said earlier, there is a lot going on behind the scenes. Not only are there evil or demonic or unclean spirits, but there are other types of spirits. With regard to the angels, Paul writes in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, as he's talking about heavenly angels and Christ being better than the angels, he says, but the angels, with regard to the angels, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? The word means serve. What do the angels do? They serve God. They serve us, those who will inherit salvation. So there are fallen angels, spirits, unclean, evil, demonic spirits. There are angels who are spirits. Not only that, and, and they're powerful, by the way. You know, in, in one scenario, I'll give you the reference. You can look it up later. But 2 Kings 19, verse 35, God sends the angel of the Lord, and he takes out 185,000 one night. Bang, gone. One angel. One ministering spirit. They're very powerful. So you have unclean spirits, demonic spirits, evil spirits. You have angels who are spirits. I will remind you, the woman at the well, John 4, verse 24, where Jesus says to this woman, God is spirit. Can I get an amen? amen. And they that worship him must, what? Worship. How? In spirit and in truth. The demons are spirits, the angels are spirits, God is spirit. You know, Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, our God. And God is spirit. You know that man has a spirit, do you know that? I'm a trichotomist. I don't know what Gordon is on this, but uh, there's nothing a little sleep over, but there are trichotomists. That, that is, this, people who believe that there are, man is made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. I believe it's in the Bible. I can give you references. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, when Paul says, I pray that God would preserve your body, soul, and spirit, right in Scripture. Also, Romans 8.16 Paul writes to the church at Rome that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I believe in the trichotomy that man is made up of a body, soul, and spirit. All that to say man has a spirit. The other side is the dichotomy. Again, this is nothing to lose sleep over, for, so just so you know, the other side believes that man has a body, and soul and spirit, they kind of squish them together. Reason being is there are references where the spirit's doing this, and in another passage, the soul's doing it. It's kind of the same thing. But I still think they're different. Some don't. Again, nothing to lose sleep over. This is not that important right now, all right? But God is spirit. The demons are spirit. The angels are spirit. And man has a spirit. And one more verse, John 6, verse 63, where Jesus says, The words I speak to you, they are spirit, and they are life. Is everybody with me? A lot of stuff going on spiritually, all right? That, all that to just say a lot of things in the spiritual realm. Is everybody with me? 
But then there is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Who is he? Well, our first reference is going to be from Acts chapter 5, where we read that he is God. In Acts chapter 5, I think many of you know this story about Ananias and Sapphira, two people in the church. In the early church, the infant church, after Jesus died and rose again, that we read in the book of Acts, that a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the money and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, this is not a bad thing to give to the church. Maybe you have property, you want to sell some property, give to the Calvary Baptists and further missions and whatever, renovations, whatever. There's nothing wrong with giving money to the church, all right? Um, or to God, really, you give it to God. However, in this case, the people lied, so watch. In verse 3, Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the money of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? For you have not lied to men, but to God. Remember he said a little while ago, you lied to the Holy Spirit? You really lied to God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three are the true and living God. This is kind of easy for you if you're a Christian to understand with the Holy Spirit. God has revealed this to you, I'm sure. But as you're trying to tell others about this, understand, people with devoid of the Spirit, people who have not been born again, do not have the Holy Spirit, this is hard for them to grab. You're telling them these three are one, and anybody, you know, logically would say, excuse me? You know, they think you're a cuckoo. Uh, one, easy, one of the easiest ways that I've found to explain this um, is water. Uh, this doesn't grab it, but it comes close. It comes about the closest of all the other things. Forget the egg. See, you might have heard the egg thing. Get, throw that thing away. That's, that's crazy. You know. But water, H2O, can be fluid. We can put it in the freezer, and it can turn solid. We can also put it on the stove and boil it, and it'll turn to vapor or steam. And if you put a cover up high and it, the steam hits it, it'll turn right back to waterfall, right back down again. All that to say that whether fluid, ice, or vapor, these three are one in essence. They are all H2O. Is everybody with me? So too, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one in essence. They do different things. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. And it was the son who purchased our redemption with his blood, who paid for our sins. And the Holy Spirit who indwells us and seals us, the scriptures say, as a down payment for heaven. So all that to say that who is the Holy Spirit? He is God. And as we're going to read in a minute, if you believe, He is in you. The God of the universe is inside of you. I want you to chew on that today. I want you to really think about this. What does He do? Well, let's go to the Gospel of John. We'll look at a few verses in John and we'll be done. Again, this is not going to be exhaustive. We're not going to get every single thing he can do. I'm just giving you a couple things to chew on, meditate, think about, because the God of the universe is in you if you believe. And if you don't believe, he can be in you if you believe. That's what I'm going to tell you. So in John 3, verse 3, Jesus is talking, and he tells a man, a, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, first Irishman in the Bible, Nick-o-demus, got it? 
he tells him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, now chew on this for a minute. Think about this. Unless God does something, nothing is going to happen. Everybody got this? Unless God gives his spirit, according to the scriptures now, and I remind you, Jesus said, thy word is truth. This is truth. Unless God gives his spirit, no one can see the kingdom of God. You're saying, where are you getting this, Dan? I'm sorry, we, we just read it. Let's read it again slowly. Truly, truly, the Greek word is amen. It's where we get amen from. When you say amen, you're saying true. You're speaking truth. Amen, amen, Jesus said. Unless a, a man is born again, a man or woman is born again of the Holy Spirit. Unless a happens, b cannot. Unless a man or woman is born again of the Holy Spirit, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you ever tried witnessing to someone you feel like you were talking to the wall? You know, you're trying to explain it. You're trying to make it as simple as possible. And they're looking at you like, you believe what? <laughs> you, you believe somebody rose from the dead? You actually believe that? Again, without the Spirit of God, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Pray that God would send his Spirit to those you love, to those that you're friends with, to those you work with, pray that God would open their eyes because they cannot see. Imagine if I took a blind man, a person in here, let's say there was a person visiting, blind from birth, it had just rained, the sun is shining, and there's a beautiful rainbow, and I took him outside, I say, hey, man, look at that rainbow, isn't that awesome? And, and the man say, what are you talking about? The rainbow, can't you see it? No, I, I, I cannot see, I'm, I'm blind. A person cannot see unless a he or she has been born again of the Holy Spirit. So you don't miss it. He says it again, verse 5. Nicodemus first says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can a person be born again when he is old? He cannot enter into his mother's womb and come back out again, can he? No, of course not. Uh, he says again, amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God again. Two things got to happen. One is, you got to be born first. Born of water is not baptism. You may have heard that from some people. That's not what he's talking about. How many here have had a child? How many women here have had a child? <laughs> what happens right before the child is born? The water breaks. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the first nine months of your life, you were Aquaman, <laughs> all right? Just so you know. I don't know if you ever chewed on this, ever given a little thought. You were living in a sack of water. Try doing that today. Try living underwater for a couple minutes and tell me how you make out, you know? Again, this is the most amazing. When you start thinking about what God is saying, you were living in a sack, amniotic fluid to be exact. You were living there for, two, for nine months, approximately, give or take. I mean, this is how God ordained it. While you were in your mother's womb, he molded and shaped you in bones and tissue and veins and brains and blood and t muscle and flesh. It's, it's coming together. I mean, people want to say this just happened? Are, are, you, are you serious? Are you, do you have a brain? How could that possibly just happen? There's no way that could happen by chance. There's no way. It would be like, let's say, let's say one of my guys got out of jail. I'm giving him a ride down to the Plymouth. He, we go by the beach. We're walking along the beach. It's low tide, and I see a watch on the shore. I pick up the watch, and I say to him, you see this watch, Joe? Yeah. A long time ago, there was a little gear floating around in the ocean. And after millions and millions, another little round gear came along, and 
And after some more gears came along, and then after millions of more years, some hands came along, a couple of, couple of lines, and, and then some numbers came along, and, and you know, 20 billion years later, voila, the watch. You know, let me just tell you, a human being is far more complex than a watch. Can I get an amen? They didn't just come together by themselves. It's creation screams that there must be a creator. All you need, as Ray Comfort puts it, is an eye that sees and a brain that thinks. That's all you need. That's all you need. You look at a picture. We get any pictures here? Okay, let's look at this. Um, I don't know who put those words on that paper, but I know someone created it. You can say, well, how do you know that? Have you seen it? Did you see that? No, I didn't see it. Do you know who the person No, I don't. But I know it didn't just happen. You know, the words didn't just flash up there. Nobody came walking in with a bucket of paint. It all fell down and splashed. There it is. There's, there's no way that could happen. Can I get an amen? All you need is an eye that sees and a brain that works. You know, look at a house, a church. If I walked up to this church and I told someone outside standing there, i say, you see this church? Long time ago, there was nothing here. Bam, it just happened. You know? I say, what? They say, no, somebody was to build. I say, how do you know somebody built it? Did you see him? No. Do you know who it was? No. Then how do you know somebody built it? Well, I, you know, I, I just, I got, a, I got an eye that sees, I got a brain that works. You know? This is not odd. Can I get an amen? But our schools actually teach that a long time ago, there was nothing. No God, no earth, no stars, nothing. Let me ask you a question. If, if there was ever a time there was nothing, again, no God, no moon, stars, nothing. If there was ever a time there was nothing, what would there be today? Yeah, this is not hard. This, this is not hard, you, again. It's not a hard thing. But do you see what sin does to people? It blinds them. Even the scriptures say the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving lest they should see the glorious gospel. What does the Spirit do? He opens eyes. He helps a person enter into the kingdom of God. He convicts people of sin. Notice um, in John chapter 16. We're going to just spend the last couple minutes in 16, 14, 15. Just three full verses will be done. But in Gospel of John chapter 16, if you look at verse 13, I, well, actually back up a little bit. I think it's 8 and 9. Um, here's what Jesus says. He talks about the helper in verse 7 i got to go away so I can send the helper. Who is the helper? The Holy Spirit. Notice, verse 8. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts people of sin. That's what happened to me in jail. Many of you know I... They didn't give you a Bible in school, but if you go to jail, they give you one. Isn't that great? I got a Bible in jail, and I, was, I read it, and I was convicted. I realized, you know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. You know, I'm, real, I'm reading these things, and I'm thinking, John, I've been doing these things all my life. And I was convicted. I started to feel dirty. And I was smoking cigarettes at the time, and, and all of a sudden, the cigarette felt dirty. I mean, I smoked for 20 years, never bothered me. But all of a sudden, it doesn't feel right. And so I throw it in the toilet, and I grab my Bible. Is there anything in here about cigarettes, you know? And there wasn't. But I, I read a verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price, namely the precious blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body. 
And so I was convicted. And, and right at that moment, the guy next door in the next house says, hey, you got a smoke over there? I said, yeah, you know what? I reached through the bars, gave him my whole pack. I said, keep him, I'm done. I should have thrown him in the toilet, but I wasn't thinking. But that was the last time I smoked because I had the power of God to say no to sin. And it was awesome because from there we went to marijuana and cocaine and drinking and fighting. And God started taking all the, I don't have to do this stuff anymore. I don't have to follow the crowd and do what everybody does. I can, I can be a man. I can do what's right. And I like it. I like it. For someone who did wrong all their life, I kind of like doing right. Nobody gets hurt. I don't got to lie. I don't got to steal. I don't got to punch nobody out. I like this. I can't say why everybody wouldn't want to be a Christian. Why? Because the Spirit convicted me. What else does he do? Well, in John 14, notice a couple verses here. John 14, verses 15 through 17. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. What does abide mean? To stay, remain, live, or dwell. I will ask the Father to give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, who will live with you forever. And even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he will dwell with you or live with you, and he will be where? In you. Who did we say the Holy Spirit was? God. Where does the Bible say he will be? In you. I don't know if you've ever chewed on this before, but today I want you to meditate. The God of the universe is living in you. Nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing. Nothing. Ask, believing, and you shall receive. Seek, you will find and knock, and the door will be open. The God of the universe, he will be in you. Again, chew on that. Jump down to verse 26. Jesus also says about this Holy Spirit, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you uh, some things, He will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He does this to me all the time. Let me ask you, have you ever been talking to someone and bang, a, po a verse pops in your head? You ever done that? I, I know you have. God says it's the Holy Spirit. He will bring to remembrance all that he said. You know, I'll, I'll give you an illustration. Uh, Gordon and I grew up in a tough area, and and uh, we did some fighting when we were younger, and, and I actually was in the ring, boxing, um, you know, as a fighter, making money uh, professionally. And I, you know, hung up the gloves a long time ago, and I have no desire really for fighting anymore, and I don't. God has changed my heart. But I will say, every once in a while, as I've got the TV on, and I'm flipping through the channels, I see a fight. Sometimes I watch it for a little while, because if two people know what they're doing, it can be an art. You know, the name of the game is to hit, Bob, weave, duck without getting hit. All right, so there's kind of both people are doing this. You got to hit, but duck, don't get hit. All right, and it, when two people are really good at been doing this years, it's almost an art. So I watch it for a little while. Sometimes you see these people jump in the ring and they come in and all, I'm gonna beat you, man, and they stand in the ring like this. I'm gonna beat your face in and this and that. There was one guy that was actually flipping around. You know, it was one of them UFC guys. He flipping around doing flips and all this and everything else. The bell rang, and as he flipped around and this and that and get the other guy, the guy went, bam, one punch, bang, out cold. Out cold. I don't know if you've seen it. You ever seen it on Facebook? Out cold, just like that. You know what? Now, 
the Holy Spirit brought to remembrance a verse. Anybody know what it was? I'll give you a hint. Pride comes just before the fall. Just before the fall. Why? Because thy word is truth. You want me to get to the chase? You want me to just cut to the chase? You want me to just tell you what this is all about? Thy word is truth. This is what we've been looking for all our lives. Can I get an amen? amen. We've been looking for the truth. What's it all about? Can I get an amen? amen? Who am I? Where did I come from? And where am I going? It's all about truth. We're starving for it. And the world tells you these crazy things. You're just a grown-up germ. You came from nothing. Father Meteorite was floating around. A couple of dead cells, you know, fish became legs and ape, and here we are. The world's been telling you and deceiving you all these lies for years, and all we want, all we want is just give me the truth, please. Just give me the truth, will you? And here it is right in our laps. You know the book in your lap is the number one bestseller year after year after year after year. Always number one bestseller. At the same time, it's the least read. Everybody got to have one, but nobody wants to open it except put flowers in there, a couple pictures, and let it gather dust up on the shelf. The story of a little girl and her mom in the living room one day. The little girl says, Mommy, what's that book up there on, on, the, on the top of the library? And, and, and the mother looked up, Oh, Sally, that's the Holy Bible. That's God's Word. And she said, well, Why don't we give them back to them? Ain't nobody reading it down here. <laughs> I mean, you laugh. But that is the honest to God's truth. The Word of God is truth. All about who we are where we came from, where we're going, all the answers are right here and nobody will forget it. And we who have, of course, want to tell the world, can I get an amen? But the God of this world, small g, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And our job is to pray, ask, seek, knock, and share the blessed gospel. Can I get an amen? We better share this. We're only here for a little while. The world is not going to tell them. Don't, don't count on the world. The world doesn't know him. They're not going to tell them about Jesus. we gotta, we got we to gotta do this. So this prayer thing, uh, you know, we're gonna do, next year, your pastor, we're going to talk about revival. We're going to make all things new. That's what the scriptures say. And we've got to tell others about Jesus because time is running out. And everybody's going to die. So far, one out of one dies. After this, judgment. There are only two ways to die. In the faith or in your sin. The only way to get rid of your sin is to believe on Jesus. But if you don't and die in your sin. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wondering what that noise was. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh is to believe on Jesus. All right, two more verses, we're done. Chapter 15, verse 26. Again, what does the Holy Spirit do? Again, I'm just giving you a couple things to think about. He brings to remembrance everything Jesus said. And then it says in 26, but the helper, again, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He bears witness, or he will testify of Jesus. You want to know if you have the Holy Spirit? You love talking about Jesus. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you know the truth, and you want others to know the truth, because you don't want them to believe they're a grown-up germ. Some people were taught this their whole life. And if you look at them, they're not very happy. Most people that don't believe in God, they're not very happy people. You know Why? Because they, they're a grown-up germ. I'm just a grown-up germ. And then when I die, I go back in the ground, and that's life. I mean, are you kidding me? Why would somebody teach somebody that? Well, unless God opens their eyes, they can't see. The Spirit will glorify 
Jesus. He will bear witness of Jesus. God bears witness of Jesus. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit bears witness of Jesus. There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. All right, last two verses. 16, 13 and 14. Here's what Jesus says again. Regarding the Spirit, notice again, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you. Oh, you got Acts 16. Uh, John, you got John 16 up there? In John 16, uh, verse 13, 14, it says, When the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit of truth, He will guide you into all truth. Again, this is what we're starving for. We're starving for truth. The Spirit will guide us into all truth. And notice, He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. And in verse 14, it says, He will glorify Me. There it is. What does the Holy Spirit do? Glorifies Jesus. What do we want to do? Glorify Jesus. We want it because there's no other name. There's no other way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will get to the Father except by me. Only his blood can wash away all our sins. Remember, we all got them. We got bad thoughts. We've said bad words. We've done bad things. And all these things are sin against the holy God, punishable by hell. And our only way out is Jesus. He's the one who took our punishment, took our beating, shed his blood to wash away all our sins, that whosoever, believing in him, will not perish. I repeat, they will not perish, but will have eternal life. Can I get an amen? You know, there are a couple other verses you can write these down and look at. Ephesians 1.13 we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit, He lives in you, God Himself. I want to share a story that I'm told is true. I haven't really researched it, but you've heard it, I'm sure. And it is about a famous chief of a tribe way out in the jungle who was notorious and had killed a lot of people. And when the, this reporter in the States got wind of this, that this vicious warrior who was known for killing many, many, many people uh, had come to Christ and become a Christian, she had to go out there and do a story. So she gets permission from her boss and books a flight to go to Africa and find this person and do an interview. So while she's in the airport waiting, she begins some small talk with the person beside her. So, where are you from? Where are you doing? Where are you, uh, where are you going? Blah, blah, blah. You know, she's, well, I'm going to interview a famous warrior who had become a Christian out in the jungle of, Ar of, of Africa. And he said, I know the guy you're talking about. And she says, really? He says, oh, yeah. It's true. It's true. She says, um, she said, well, can you tell me about it? I said, well, I, I don't know, but I, I can tell you what you've heard is true. He, he was vicious. He became a Christian. But you've got to ask him about this because I heard not long ago in a heated confrontation, he killed another person. She said, really? He said, yeah, put that in your report. So she said, I will. So she gets on the plane, meets her interpreter, goes into the jungle, and gets her interview with this warrior. And through the interview, begins asking these questions. I hear you want to a vicious warrior. Oh, yes, yes, we, we had to kill a lot of people to survive. And this and that, blah, blah, blah. She said, but I understand you became a Christian. Oh, yes, a man came and shared Christ with us, and I and my tribe became Christians, and now we love and we do this and that and everything. She says, awesome. So you're writing her notes down, and she says, Chief, i got to ask you one more question. I understand, not long ago, that you lost it in an argument. You killed somebody. He said, yes, that is true. And she said, well, Chief, what happened? And he tried to explain the best he could in his language, and again, through the interpreter, he, he said it's, 
It's like I had these two bears inside of me. One is a good bear, and one is a bad bear. And so the reporter said, so the bad bear came out a couple weeks ago. Yes, yes, that's what happened. So she said, uh, she writing her things in her notes, and she says, well, Chief, how do you know in any given situation or circumstance, how do you know which bear is going to come out of you? And again, he thought, and he thought for a long time, and, and he said, like a light shone, and he goes, I know. The one I feed is the one that comes out. You know, for someone who was out in the jungle and never been to school, he pretty much hit the nail on the head, did he not? If you're one who likes the boob tube, which, by the way, only sells sex and, dr uh, sex and violence, that's what TV does, that's what sells, that's what people want, so that's what they give everybody. Uh, if you just watch sex and violence, sex and violence, sex and guess which bear's going to come out? This is not hard. The bad bear's coming out. But if you get in the Word, no Bible, no breakfast, you get. You, again, you, we're going to do this every year, I just reminded you. If you're in the Word and you fill your mind with the Word of God, the good bear's going to come out. The Holy Spirit will come out. And that's what we want. If you're like me, you're tired of doing the wrong thing. You're tired of hurting people. You want to do what's right. And we got the directions, you know, we got the directions from God. And if we fill our minds with the word of God, that's what's going to come out. The illustration is a little note that Billy Graham wrote back in the Depression. He said he wrote about a friend who lost his job during the Depression. He had a fortune, lost that. He had a wife at home, lost that. He lost everything. But he tenaciously held on to his faith, which is all he had left, his faith in God. And as he was walking down the street one day, he stopped to see some men doing some stonework on a church. And he asked this person who was working on, this, on the stonework what he was doing. He had this triangular piece of stone. And he said, what are you doing? And he says, uh, well, you, you see that opening up there in the, in the spiral? You see that middle piece, the little triangle? He said, I, I'm shaping this down here so it will fit in up there. And the guy, his eyes started to tear up. And he realized that God had just spoken to him through this guy. That God was shaping us down here so we'll be able to fit in up there. Yeah, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're going through. But I know this. We live in a sinful world. It comes at us in all different directions, all different ways and so forth. But I remind you, we're only here for a little while. And God's molding and shaping us, just like he did in the womb. He's molding and shaping us to fit in up there. Father, thank you. Thank you for you. There's no one like you. Nobody. No one comes close. Thank you for your son, the living word of God, who took our beat and shed his blood, paid for all our sins so we could have life with you. Thank you for your written word, the scriptures which the Spirit brings to remembrance and helps us do the right thing, make the right choices. Thank you for your spirit who lives in us, God himself, who empowers us, convicts us of when we're even thinking the wrong thing or getting ready to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and gives us the power to do the right thing, to think the right thing, to say the right thing. Thank you for molding and shaping us down here so we will fit in with you. We love you. We praise you. 
and we worship you this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we all stand? <clears throat> in a moment, we're going to sing a song that Michaela is going to lead us in, a song of response. God's word was spoken. Amen? Uh, heard a lot about the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit works in your life. But one phrase that got a hold of me today was that the Holy Spirit is in you. If, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven, he's, he's making you so you fit in there, right? Uh, that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. But if the Holy Spirit is in you, he's guiding you, amen? He, he's teaching you, right? He's convicting you. What else is he doing? He's teaching you. He's helping you testify about who Jesus is. And so if you see those things in your life, if those things are happening in your life, conviction, he's teaching you, you're growing, you're, you want to testify about Jesus, those are signs, my friends, my brothers and sisters, that Christ lives in you, that the Holy Spirit is living in you. But if they're not there, if they're absent, as we end 2018 and a new year is going to be beginning, what a wonderful thing could happen today when you pray and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior so that you know the Holy Spirit is living in you. Begin 2019 with a new start in Christ and Christ in you and your life beginning to change. It would be a wonderful thing. So as we sing unto the Lord, if God spoke to your heart and you need to talk to someone, you can come forward or talk to me after the service. But may you respond to God. Which time? 